thank you. Um, yeah, short version of my name is Kate. So uh, I'm Kate and I am development team manager uh, working in Visma. And I would like to share with you the way how Visma is managing implementation of cloud services, which we are calling Visma Cloud Delivery Model. And my experience with that uh, was implementing continuous delivery and actually continuous deployment at the end. So speaking about continuous delivery and deployment especially, before I joined Visma, I was implementing large business-to-business e-commerce platform. And um, our CTO was coming to me and saying, yeah, I want to have eight deployments per day. And I thought, y y you shouldn't do that. Just no way. Because eight times per day, we're going to roll out changes to the production. So eight times per day, my users are going to have some change. Uh, they can get an incident. No way. Just, just, just don't come to me about that. And you know what? I was wrong. And this is why I really want to share my story with you and encourage you to do that, to go so far up to continuous deployment. But before I will dig into just two words about Visma so we would get into the context. Now, Visma is uh, international company product development. We have more than 200 products and we focus on mission critical ERP systems. So they're even more sensitive than my B2B e-commerce platform I was making. These systems like procurement, like um, invoicing, like HRM, as an example, uh, planning shifts in hospitals for doctors. Well, that's obviously is mission critical and that's not what you want to fail eight times per day. I want to highlight here two numbers. One is we have more than three and a half thousand developers now. So it's not an organization you can fix or change like this. And another number is this, 70% of cloud computing by the end of last year. I don't know how they counted this number exactly, but we do have a lot of services in cloud, that's for sure. But this number, the 70%, it wasn't, it wasn't so high all the time. There was zero at some point of time, obviously. And we were close to zero around five years ago. And around five years ago, we ha have made a strategy that we want to get here up to 90%. This, that's a strategy. So we had a challenge. But challenge was not just to go to cloud. Okay, you can take a product and just host it in cloud. Don't change anything, just host it there. Can you do that? Yes. Does it give you a value? No. So Visma put it a challenge to have awesome products in cloud. So make it for real. But they also made a wish to have awesome teams that would manage these products and if we are using latest technologies, we want to have awesome products, awesome processes. So that's our wish, that's a challenge. But we have more than 200 products and we have more than 3,000 developers. Well, I'll try to imagine here a queue of 3,000 people and we're just pushing them to climb to cloud. That wouldn't be a, a good idea. And this man understood it they realize that they cannot come to 200 product owners and say, now you need to take your product and put it to cloud. Good luck. That also would not work. So they thought, okay, let's dream. What do we want to get at the end? And they concluded this thought. What we want is to have the team that is fully accountable for the service in charge. This is our dream, our ultimate goal. But what does it mean? First of all, this team should be really good in building our awesome product. It should use latest technologies. It should use cloud, maybe artificial intelligence, machine learning, all the great new technologies we 
have now access using cloud. We also need to ensure that the team is able to uh, use the uh, best processes, building and managing technical debt, as an example, when they're uh, building, when they're developing our products. So the team should be really awesome when they build. We also want to ensure that the same team, not going to anyone else, is able to deploy it. And of course, the ship that we are going to uh, deploy, it should have a great quality. So the team needs to be able to deploy changes to test environments, ensure good quality, and ship it out to our customers. So to sum up, the team needs to be fully responsible for dev. But that's not enough, because what we wanted is to have team fully accountable. So our product will be delivered to customers, and our customers will start to use it. At that point of time, we need to start operating our infrastructure. We need to have backups. We need to have monitoring. We need to have alerts. We need to apply security patches. So team should also do all this. So team should be responsible for ops, but also for OOPS. Because sometimes we do deliver bugs. Nothing to do. It happens. And we want to ensure that the team that is fully accountable for the service is able to handle this situation so they would not look like this. Because normally developers, they don't know even where and how to register incidents because they were never asked to do that. Operational people were doing that. So Visma had a challenge and had a great dream. So when they did, they developed Visma Cloud Delivery Model. They realized that they cannot create one process that would fit all 200 products, all 3,000 developers using different technologies, some are on Java, some are on COBOL, some are on .NET. You cannot have one fit all. So instead, instead of processes, they define set of requirements, and they called it the CDM. Now, if you as a team for your service fulfilled all these requirements, you still can have deviations, you will be onboarded to the CDM. It's an honor, actually, in our organization to be the CDM team. It means that you put it so much effort in order to fulfill this requirement that your service really is trusted by organization. Your team is trusted that you can handle also issues on the production by yourself, that you can really be fully accountable. You also get some bonuses like you automatically are uh, ISO 9001 and ISO 27001 certified and some more. And as here we have Visma Cloud, we made a very strict decision. All the services that need to go to public cloud must be VCDM. You cannot physically get your service published on cloud uh, so that customers would start to use it if you haven't fulfilled these requirements and you haven't been onboarded to VCDM. Of course, it's tough. It's not easy. That's why there was one more decision made in order to achieve our high strategic goal. All new services must be developed in cloud, if uh, it's possible in terms of contracts, because sometimes you just physically cannot, you're not allowed. But if you can, it must be in cloud, means it must comply with the VCDM requirements. And these requirements, just to give an example, in theory, you could say, okay, each service, you should be able to roll it back. If something went wrong during the deployment, right? You can say, yeah, in each service, there should be a process where you are testing the rollback each time before you're going, uh, before you're pushing it to the production. But that wouldn't be clever, right? Not all services can support it, and it's quite heavy process. What VCDM is saying instead is, dear team, you need to build your service 
in such a way that it should be able to roll back. It should be able to have um, backward compatibility for APIs, but it's actually up to you how you are going to do it. You can say, uh, we are not going to use versions of APIs. We are not going to have rollbacks. We will have only roll forwards. But you have to define what is your strategy to ensure that you have not more than 90 minutes to recover from the incident. So instead of saying how we should do it, they're saying this is an ultimate goal, this is requirement, how you, dear team, will fulfill it. At the end, VCDM is DevOps. One team accountable for both development and operations. So we have breaking the wall between Dev and Ops. And also DevOps in terms of the DevOps cycle, VCDM is focusing a lot on automation. So let me show you how that works. VCDM onboarding uh, is a process which starts when the product owner, or we're calling them service owners, decides I want to get my service in cloud or I know I need to build a new service. Of course, everything starts with a team. Team needs to be created and it's mandatory to have infrastructure engineer in the team. If a team doesn't have one, where he needs to be recruited, where he needs to be appointed. But we also have additional roles that need to be distributed across the team members, including security engineer and tech um, UA and incident change and release coordinators. So all these roles we have described and they need to be assigned to resources in the team and uh, really understood by team members. Now when roles are assigned, we have a team, we're starting a kickoff meetings. So these are presentations done by our process owners who are saying here are our requirements. On the presentation is just one hour meeting for each of them. They are giving high level demands. As an example for release management, they're saying you need to have delivery pipeline automated. Last step is okay to be manual, but everything should be up to one button click. In the test, they're saying you need to have a strategy, agreement in your team on how are you going to work with uh, test automation, with test environments, how are you going to test. With uh, monitoring, we need to ensure that we have created the monitoring and we have defined monitoring alerts for the operations team who is going to help us only during nights. And so on. So these are one hour meetings where full team must participate. Even UX is participating in all these meetings to know what are requirements we have. When we have these uh, presentations, we then are getting self-assessments. Now, that is quite a big part. What, what are they? It's checklists with uh, all requirements we have from the company for the, uh, our new cloud service. Requirements in terms of continuous delivery, like do you avoid long leaving branches? Do you have um, versions for each build? And so on. How you are managing artifacts? Security, we need to go through all AWSP checklist cheat sheets and uh, validate that our service really both on the paper and really implemented uh, like if we are sending email, do we have protection from phishing? Privacy, all the GDPR requirements. Reliability, this is SLAs. If we have signed with the SLA, the SLA with our customer, that uh, we don't have more than 90 minutes of a downtime per, per month, let's say, uh, then we need to ensure that we fulfill this requirement. And so on and so on. And big part is technical debt management. As an example, static code analysis, we cannot avoid it. We must have it as a part of our delivery pipeline. So here we have che uh, checklists. For each point, we need to recommend how we fulfill it or have a jury issue that we have deviation. When we know what we need to do in order to fulfill requirements, we have time 
to resolve them. This typically is taking majority of time. Normally, full process takes six to nine months. It's not easy to get there, but one team managed to make it in two months, but they were not doing completely anything except that. And final approval. This is where we are getting audit. Uh, if we really fulfilled all the requirements, we are teached on how to handle incidents and changes on the production, and we are integrated with VCDM tools like Ops Genie so that uh, Night Shift would be able to receive alerts. So all this we are we making for each new service, which is going to be built on cloud. And this is to ensure that when we have built it, our product and it launched, it's launched to our customers, at that point, it's already on continuous delivery. So let me show you how the product itself will look like. Now, first of all, we, of course, need to build a business functionality, the key of uh, our new service. But alone, it will not survive. Any service, we need to have authentication, customer management, user management, uh, authorization, and uh, license management. So we have central services that are available for all microservices that we are building in cloud so that our users would not need to have different authentication to each our product. So we need to integrate our service with them. We also need to ensure that user will be able to navigate across our microservices, and that's why we have common landing page and common navigation. We also want to ensure that we have common look of, as an example, help center across services. So we are integrating to that as well. And of course, services need to be integrated with each other, otherwise, well, they will not work or not, will not give a value to the customer. That's why or they are integrated directly with the ones they need, or we're using message queue so they would uh, start to speak with each other. So these are all business integrations which each new microservice needs to develop. Additionally, we need to ensure that we are able to operate our products on the production. So that's why we need to make uh, logging. We need to have monitoring, alerting. Um, we are able to use till somewhat the tools we want to use. However, they are defined in the list of acceptable tools. So majority are using uh, AppDynamics for monitoring. Those who cannot, they have a list of tools that are allowed. The same for logging. We use Greylog in majority. Alerting, there are different tools, but uh, as an example, Ops Genie. Uh, we need to have feature toggling because it's part of continuous delivery. Some are making own solutions. Uh, we can use uh, Launch Darkly as an example. And localization. All our services must be localized, so crowding now is uh, one of the tools we are using. But we also can make our own. So all this needs to be developed in addition to your key functionality in order to go alive to production. So let me show you the development process, how it looks uh, when service is accepted to be VCDM onboarded and we are launching our service to customers. It's quite classical. Uh, everything starts with a requirement. A requirement is made by our product owner or business analyst, and we're using Jira to handle them. It's mandatory to have for all requirements acceptance criteria because we need to know what to test. And when developer is receiving requirement, he needs to develop not only the requirement itself, the functionality, but also unit and uh, component integration tests. And this part is mandatory, and acceptance criteria is a thing that will help developer to understand what to cover with component integration tests especially. Now, when development is finished, uh, the pull request is created in Stash, and it's, uh, the code reviewer is assigned for another developer. While he's doing that, we are 
in parallel, making a belt using a Team City or Jenkins, and running all the static code analysis from Coverity, the Sonar Cube, and Qualis Guard. If they will say that there is a major deviation, the pull request cannot be approved. You cannot get it deployed at all. So change will not be merged. In parallel, all the tests are launched on the build machine. And only when all of this is accepted, only then uh, the pull request will be merged to the master branch. And again, we will run all the unit tests already on the master branch. And again, only if they succeed, then we are starting deploying. So we are ensuring the quality of our product at the very beginning of development cycle. The deployment, uh, it could be Team City and Octopus, it could be uh, uh, Jenkins, again, depending on the technology uh, team is using. Now, how looks the deployment process? As everything starts with the merge, uh, First of all, we are deploying to internal test environment. Now, I, I show you uh, that we have a lot of integrations. But a lot of integrations means it's quite hard to test. If these guys manage to change something, and they haven't told us, we failed, we cannot even understand is it our failure or it is their failure. That's why first environment that we have internal doesn't have any integration. We are testing only our own functionality. But integrations, they still need to give us some information. So we are mocking them. And now it's becoming more popular to use Mountain Bank for that. But some teams, like my current team, we have developed our own mocking service. Here on internal test environment, we are running our automated tests. In, and if they succeed, we are deploying to stage. Now stage is a final product, uh, final environment before production. So there, we again are running automated tests, those that are meant for uh, stage environment. And our QA is doing exploratory tests and develop auto tests. Because usually, in our teams, QA and tech QA is one and the same person. Tech QA is the one who will write auto tests. When exploratory tests are done, and feature is tested, then with the manual pressing the button, we are releasing it to production. So 95% of teams that are going to VCDM are going to production with this process. But this process has some challenges. And challenge number one is you have more than one developer. And you know what, they are working both together. That's very much surprise, but they do. And let's imagine that this is bug fix that I need to have on the production. And this is new functionality. But they were developed in this order. So if I will try to deploy this change to production, I will deploy this new bug. So I cannot do that. But I really, really need this. So what to do? use feature toggles. Now, if we would hide this feature, this new feature, under the feature toggle, which would say, yes, activate it, or no, use old, old functionality, then this test using old functionality would always pass. And I would be safe to deploy it to production. Because this new code, even though it have a bug inside, it's not activated for users. So our first lesson that we got on the production was make each new change under the feature toggle so that we would be able to release later changes faster. And our process changed to this. We started to put all the changes under the feature toggles all new changes. Obviously, bug fixes were going as the bug fixes. Otherwise, we would have too many feature toggles. 
but tests automatically were passing because we were not activating them. So each time it was safe to uh, press the button. If they would uh, fail and uh, screw up something while they were doing feature toggles, our automated test would catch it. So the new challenge that we got was, have you deployed to production? And I was the one who was pressing the button. Um, and my answer was, I forgot. Because we discussed in the morning that we need to, we are safe to roll out. And I went to meetings. I thought, OK, I will do it after meetings. My meetings ended at 4 o'clock. And at 4 o'clock, it's quite late still to do the deployment. So it had to go to the next day. So that wasn't really good. At the same time, it was, it was safe to do almost any moment. The second related issue that we got was, have you added feature toggle? And we got again, again the problem. He forgot, and we again cannot deploy to the production. So what we have learned is that it's actually much easier to remove human factor. If we know that each feature is hidden and we are using old, old functionality, then actually this step when I'm pressing the button uh, is not needed. We can automate it. And we also learned this. For developers, it's actually much easier to know that each their change actually will go to production than it might go to production. Because if it might go, I can forget about feature toggle. But if I know all the time it will go, I have no other options, then uh, the mindset is changing. So as a result, deployment process uh, looked like this. Each change is merged with a feature toggle. It's deployed to the uh, internal test environment, automated tests for previous functionality are working and saying old functionality works. The same goes to stage. Old functionality works. Yes, automated test says green, everything good. We are going to production straight away. But feature is not activated. Then our QA uh, is making exploratory tests and run, uh, writing new automated tests. And only when he or she is done here, then we are running automated tests. We're checking, yes, they're catching the new functionality, and new functionality is covered. Developer now can remove the feature toggle and merge it. Now, when it will be deployed, already new automated tests will check on internal and stage environments that everything is good, and it will be released to production. So we completely split it, the deployment and releasing into two different, um, different phases and different times. Now, results. Um, we started it a year ago, a little bit more end of August. And most probably you don't see, but we have roughly one, two releases per day. And as an example, in February, there was 50 releases, 50 deployments. Sorry, this is deployments to production. Uh, but in, in uh, average, they're making 25, 30 deployments per month. This approach works for microservices. Uh, it might not work if you have a huge monolith. However, you can reuse a lot from that, like using feature toggles. And the reason is very simple. is because from the moment when you have here, good example, from the moment you merged till the moment we went to the production, if we have more than two hours, we cannot work like that just because we will have too many changes piling up, uh, too many commits piling up. Uh, so two hours, it's already too much. Uh, one of VCDM requirements is that we are not even allowed to have more than two hours between, uh, between the merge and the moment of uh, going to production. Uh, so this approach will work for serverless. 
as well, but not for the monolith. For monolith, you will need to use a different approach. Um, what else? I'm super fast by some reason. <laughs> so hopefully we'll have more time for questions. Uh, takeaways. Uh, set expectations. Uh, especially in large organization, you really cannot make uh, cannot make one process fit all. That's why instead of setting processes, really define expectations. And uh, these checklists, uh, for me, were really useful because they allowed me to not forget about something. Even the small thing about emails and uh, are we do we have protection from phishing. We managed to forget about it, but at the last moment when we were going through the uh, requirements again, we saw, okay, that's something we missed. Very good. Aim high. If you think that it's really good idea to just rush with the development and let's get it somehow to production, just host it in virtual machine and that's it. Why do we need to spend time on continuous uh, integration and continuous delivery? Well, that will cost you as a result much more afterwards to implement. It's easier and better to implement it straight away. So it's really good to aim high from the beginning. Motivate. Um, not all developers are ready for that. Not all companies are ready for that. Uh, I had also fights with some of developers who didn't want, as an example, to use feature toggles. They were saying, well, we will have 100 feature toggles and it will be hard to maintain the code. Come on, that's a bad idea. Well, my answer on that is if you have 100 feature toggles, it means you have 100 features you developed, but you haven't released them to your customer. Why have you started the new feature? You still have 100 you haven't done yet. Also, in terms of motivation, the good idea is to try give them fail. Give them the task where they will understand that it's really much easier for them to have automated processes than to continue as they got used to. My example was uh, we were making uh, microservice architecture inside microservice and guys made two big split. As a result, when I asked them, okay, you don't believe me that you have too many of them, now implement authorization. And authorization needed to go through four microservices to get one call authorized. Then they told, yeah, sorry, we, we are wrong. But yes, as a result, they had to redo. They had to merge them, and they re needed to redo authorization. But sometimes you just don't have other option to explain them that they really need to, uh, to use continuous delivery and how to use it. So give them fail. Sometimes you will lose time, but you will get more motivation from them to follow it afterwards. Use feature toggles. Well, it's not mandatory to use really feature toggles all the time. You can use different techniques like uh, API versions, or uh, you can have a different branch that you will uh, deploy on a separate container with the separate instances. You can do like that as well. Uh, but uh, the logic is still the same, like to use feature toggles. You need to have an option to develop something not activated to customers, but deploy it to production. And automate. Uh, there were a lot of good talks about automations that sometimes we are automating too much, and I agree with them, uh, but really focus on automation. Don't forget about it. Don't um, be lazy. Be lazy to do the repetitive work. If you can automate it, do it. And that's it. You will have 10 more minutes for lunch. <laughs> no? <laughs> That's good. Um, 
no, because, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question, actually. Uh, first of all, project manager needs to help the team to get all this uh, done. Uh, that is one part. But uh, when I was pressing this button by myself, it was actually enormously good motivation to improve our processes. Because I, I was working a lot with release management. I have more than eight years of experience. I know how to crush production in many different ways. That's not a problem. So each time I needed to press this button, I was saying to my team, I'm crossing my fingers. Really, I was stressed. I needed to go afterwards and test it by myself because I was so worried. When we made the last change and automated it fully, it was a stone falling down from my shoulders. So if you want to motivate your managers to improve your processes, I recommend you go and tell them that now you are the ones pressing the button to deploy changes to production. Really, it works. Uh, yep. Um, no, I don't demand unit test coverage for 100%. I demand my developers to either test manually their changes or to be lazy and automate those tests that are needed. So I am focusing more on component integration tests. That's why I was showing we have acceptance criteria because uh, a lot of time, there was a period of time in the project when I had the QA, manual QA, available two hours per week. How do you think, is it enough to test application if you have two hours per week for testing? Well, it's not. That's why uh, at some point I told, uh, guys, we don't have QA at all. You're testing by yourself. Are you lazy enough or not lazy enough to do it manually each time? And they were saying no. So they, that's why they had a the motivation to automate. Plus, um, we made a really strong REST API test. So majority of my testing uh, was on REST APIs. Uh, we, that's why I knew I trusted and uh, I can really go live with the continuous deployment safe. So I am more like REST API test. Uh, UI tests a little bit. Uh, I'm not demanding uh, big coverage uh, and component integration tests because uh, we need to try to catch issues before they are deployed. Otherwise, especially when you are in microservice world, you have failed in your service, you deployed it to stage, and you screwed up all other services that are dependent on you. And this is a really large problem. We were fighting with it for several months regularly screwing up 30 other testers uh, from doing their job and having screams and shouts on us. So uh, this is your gatekeeper, really, uh, so do it. But 100%, no, for sure. Even more, uh, as a manager, do you allow working remotely? <laughs> okay. Um, as a manager, I'm working four days per week, uh, not five. I don't follow if my guys are strictly at 10 at work. Uh, if they are working, they need to work remotely, they are pinging me in the morning. The only situation which I don't like is when I spend two hours trying to find my developer who was on the daily meeting at the morning, but it's 11, I cannot find him, and then I'm told that he's skiing in Georgia. Now, this is the only case when I don't like remote work. Otherwise, if my guys are telling me that they will work remotely, uh, I have no problem with that. Part of my team is in Sweden. Uh, I have a few people in Romania. Uh, it doesn't matter where they are. And I personally love to work from home because there I can focus. I am not disturbing anyone with my meetings. Uh, so if I have full day of meeting, I prefer to work from home by myself. So I love remote work. Okay. Um, feature toggle is um, at the end condition uh, in the code which is saying if this flag is active, 
let's say for a specific customer, then use this functionality. If this uh, flag is uh, false, then use old functionality. So when we are building a new feature, we can, um, there are different uh, approaches to that, but simple is new feature will be hidden under if statement with a specific flag. Uh, the same could be a new page will be hidden. Uh, so we can create for UI a new page with a new layout and have a feature toggle in the configurations that will make a uh, ping to the database or to uh, launch darkly. Launch darkly works really good with that. They're making a ping uh, that, hey, what is the flag with this code for this customer as an example? Now launch directly will say the answer is true or false. And then by that answer, we are selecting, are we showing a new page or the old page? In case of microservices, uh, when you're implementing, when you're testing your microservice before getting to the live, in a situations when you are taking part of the monolith and moving out, you have a moment in your project when uh, mother solution this monolith, they have releases, but you are trying to test that it will work with your service. And then you're starting to screw everyone up because you have a bug or you have performance issue. So at this point of time, it's very important to have a flag in the system, use old functionality or use new microservice. And this is where feature toggles are your savers. But for me now, feature toggles are saving every, everything. That's why I really love them. Thank you.